Um, good afternoon, everybody. This is Tulani Bridgewater Kowalski with the Wolfer back today on Wolfer TV live with Lisa Papa Dimitriou. And I'm thrilled to have Lisa here with me. We went to college together. We're both Vassar gals. Um, we're not girls anymore, so we're Vassar gals. You but, never stop uh, being a gal. Exactly. We're abroad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But um, I was just telling Lisa before we started that I plan to like toot her horn quite a lot because super impressive, also very prolific. So Lisa is an author. Um, she's a speaker. She is also a platform developer. And I'm going to give her free reign to kind of tell you a little bit about who she is and what she's been up to. So yeah, thank to me. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. It's so fun to be speaking to the community. Um, right. So I, uh, I actually started my career in editorial. So I was, uh, I've been at HarperCollins, I've been at Disney, I've been at Scholastic. And I started out um, editing books and acquiring them. And, um, and after a while, you know, the funny thing about working with writers is that it starts to make that dream of being a writer seem more possible because as a, an editor, I had a front row seat to the struggle that is the manuscript, right? It, it never comes in perfect. It always takes work. And so, uh, so eventually I started writing and transitioned into becoming a full-time writer. Um, and I published a, a lot of books. Um, mostly in what's called in, in the young adult space, but also for the middle grades. And I used to refer to myself as a middle grade writer until one time I introduced myself to someone. It was actually another Vassar person. And she said, what do you do? And I said, oh, I'm a middle grade writer. And she was like, oh no, I'm sure you're good. And I was like, not like <laughs> mediocre, like <laughs> middle grade. Not middling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I have learned to correct that. Um, and teaching, I got mm -hmm. uh, my master of fine arts in writing for for young people and uh, and started teaching. Well, and I just I want to interject for a second because you say you write a lot of books, and I don't. I think we need to quantify what a lot means, and yeah. also that you're not just writing them; you're also winning awards for them. Oh, well, thank you so much. Well, oh. I mean, and uh, yeah, so I wrote, so quantifying it is actually a little bit challenging. Um, you know, in terms of like uh, things under my own name, I've published more than 20. Um, and uh, right. And for things that I have written under pseudonyms, it's, it's more than 70. Yes. So, um, you know, it gets to be a lot, a lot. Um, and I also, yeah, I even uh, co-authored a couple with um, James Patterson, which was really a fun experience. Like I've done, I've done a big breadth, hardcover, serious things, paperback, like, you know, um, it's kind of, it's, it's been a lot. Um, and, uh, but, you know, really, really fun journey to kind of do all of that to have the opportunity to do all those different kinds yeah. of things, even nonfiction, you know. Um, what I think is like super interesting about you is that you got to see it from every side, right? So you got to go through the behind the scenes portion of it and nurturing other and shepherding other authors into actually being an author yourself. And then working with, I mean, working with someone like James Patterson is like no small, that's no small taters. That's no, major. and that was a fascinating, you know, I have actually, as I've, I've written things under pseudonyms and I've actually ghost written things before um, with well-known people. And, um, but that process with James Patterson was also like, it's in and of itself a really fascinating experience. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and everything, ha you know, has, has given me so much and so much insight into different, um, areas of the creative process, even doing, you know, I've done very few, but I have done illustrated books. Um, mm. And that's a whole different learning experience too, because um, of course I'm not the illustrator. I just had to write a book that could be illustrated and that was illustrated. And that was a whole different experience. So yeah, it's been, I think that every little piece that I do kind of adds to um adds to my love for the whole process and the whole, uh, you know, the 
it adds to the insight that I have for what what all yeah. writers go through. And you know, every book is its own new child, you know, that you're shepherding through. <laughs> what I love though that because of the way that you began your career, I think that you probably view writing a little differently than people who are outside of the writing and publishing universe view it, which is generally it's seen as this very sort of solitary endeavor. And everyone pictures someone like pecking away at a keyboard in a very dark room and you know, going through this kind of emotionally cathartic experience. And not that it's not a lot of that, but it's also a highly collaborative process. And, um, and it's actually a process that benefits from a lot of structure, which kind of leads me into where you've moved with your career. Not that you've abandoned writing because obviously you're still writing very actively. And by the way, New York Times bestseller. I mean, like loads and loads of, loads of accolades. So right. let's, let's, I just want to keep putting a little pin in that. But it kind of seems like it was an interesting and possibly for you natural progression to then go into book flow. So right, absolutely. So book flow uh, is the app that I have um, that I founded, you know, to kind of to help people with the artistic journey, with the writing journey, and that that sounds a little vague, but it is actually a highly structured app that's meant to help people with their organization and uh, help improve skills, help, you know, uh, help gathering ideas and help with the motivation. Because really the hardest things for writers is staying motivated to come back to the page every day, because no matter um, no matter how much you love a project, there are times that it will frustrate you and there are times that you will resist working on it. Mm -hmm. um, or at least that's been my experience and you know the experience that I've seen with a lot of a lot of writers. I, I'm sure that there are some people who are like, no, I can't wait to write every day. But for a lot of people struggle with, with productivity, with motivation. Yeah. Um, but specifically, I started from that place of organization. Um, when I was teaching, I noticed a lot of my students really had trouble. They had so many great ideas, Tulani. Like they were so creative and they could create beautiful sentences and beautiful paragraphs and sometimes even a beautiful scene. But they had real trouble getting to the heart of the matter. And they would, you know, when you are writing a manuscript, you create a lot of material that is just not going to make it to the finished product. Because uh, while you need to create that inform, you need to know that information so that you understand the character's motivations and mm -hmm. what's driving them to make certain decisions and the relationships between them you know, you can overwhelm a book with all of that information. And ultimately you kind of want to, you want to show that information, but not necessarily have to develop it all on the page. Yeah. So, so they would struggle with that and they would cling to, you know, these things that they had created that, um, that maybe were beautiful, but just didn't serve the story. So yeah, what I wanted to do was to create something that would be broken out for each project to show you, yes, here is how a scene, what a scene needs. Here is a checklist of, for the emotional, for it to have emotional impact mm -hmm. and, you know, and to create this sort of drag and drop thing so you can reorder your scenes because chronological order is not always what we're, what best serves the story, right? Yeah. And that's also built out to support developing character backstory and relationship information separate from just the manuscript yeah um and theme information that is separate from just the manuscript you know well, I, think, I think there was something also that you mentioned that was really interesting when we were kind of you know in our preliminary talks about setting up this interview which is that you also found that you were trying to cater to a slightly different audience and and a slightly different user. And I think that that's a kind of an interesting approach. So I'd love if you could explain a little bit about sure. that. Absolutely. Well, this was why I thought it was so perfect for the Wolver because frankly, I'm interested in the kind of user that understands that writing a book is for is not really just, we're not only product oriented here. Like we're not just producing a, a novel. It's mm -hmm. a process and it's a, it's a journey. And so, and it's, it, it, uh, it requires a lot of different ideas. It requires constant engagement with the thoughts. Mm -hmm. So I 
I made my app to look beautiful and to honestly, to appeal to people who are looking for that almost spiritual and kind of the wisdom traditions behind writing. Um, and frankly, I was thinking of, of the female writers that I know. You know, mm -hmm. there are a lot of apps out there that offer you functions, like you can label this and you can color code it and you can make like a spreadsheet. Yeah. And a lot of those things feel like they are really developed with by people who have the absolute best in, you know, intentions in mind, but you have to know what that label is, why you're labeling something. You have to understand yeah. what it's for. It's not, a spreadsheet is not a manuscript. You know, there is, there Boy, is, is <laughs> a, a, if you take one thing from this talk, please take that a spreadsheet is not a manuscript. Um, Right. So, uh, you know, and, and there are kind of technical um, things that you can do to help improve your manuscript, but those don't actually have to do usually with adding a label to it. Um, yeah. It has to do with understanding the emotional flow of, because that's all a manuscript is. It's a series of emotional moments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's something really important about, you know, you kind of touched upon this, when writers are giving birth or when they're, when they're cooking it up, okay, it's not even born yet, but when you're cooking it up, a lot of it feels very precious and a lot of everything feels essential. Yeah. Um, and I think that one of the common themes I've heard is that a lot of people feel like they get in their own way. They get really bogged down. They don't know how to transition and to move on. Um, and I would imagine that this is, you know, having that kind of structure to help guide you and also to be able to you know, put things down so you can move on to the next phase because sometimes you have to come back and revisit what you've done. And also, you know, once you do finally birth this thing, it's not done, right? So you write your manuscript. Right. So actually I wrote my, my latest manuscript uh, on, on Bookflow and uh, that is coming out in 2022. And um, it was really helpful to me in the revision process because when I had to tear into it, um, it automatically separated out all my scenes. And again, I went back to the separate section for my characters and took a look at my relationships and realized that, um, you know, I was gonna have to, in order to, for, to create enough space for my story to breathe, I was gonna have to cut entire storylines and entire characters. But right. that meant I had more room to develop the others. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, so it just helped me be objective, you know, and to track everyone and to see like, okay, here's how they relate. And okay, here, I'm going to save this really great idea for mm -hmm. a different book. Because there's more where that came from. Exactly. Well, and there's also, I think that's great too, because there's this notion that um, I think people get into uh, like a fear that, like I have this one idea and that's it. Or if right. I don't have this one sentence, like that's it, I'm never gonna be able to generate something else or I'm not gonna generate something as good. Yes. When you know, I first started that. at Scholastic, I had this great uh, boss who was, I, I'm not kidding, in her eighties. And she had been there for like, you know, forever. And uh, she was a real, she was a born and bred New Yorker and she had a really heavy accent and there was one manuscript that I that I came across that I really liked and I had her read it. And she was like, hey, you know, there's a lot that's good in here, but this is like one of those writers who put every good idea she ever had into the manuscript. And I was like, oh my God, that's a really interesting insight, right? Because yeah. when you have a bunch of great ideas, you do want to put them all into the manuscript. But, yeah. um, you know, for for when when writing is a lifetime journey, you you could have to just trust that there there will be the right place. And by the way, I love that you have your like your 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 dogs back there like hanging out. Oh my god, no, I love it. I love dogs. This is I like the been, highlight of the yeah. interview for me. So <laughs> as an aside, I have dogs, I have kids. I was just like I muted myself so I could angry text my entire family, come get these crazy animals out of here. What are you guys doing? I'm trying to pretend I'm professional. You know, no, that is okay. As far as I am concerned, this is like the highlight of my squad goals are achieved. We're all hanging out together. 
Like, I love these guys. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> so but, but to come back to what you were just saying, like, I kind of think of manuscripts like a hamburger. Like, yeah. I don't want everything on my hamburger. No, it, I do. Like, but I, yes. You know what I mean? Like, I can't eat Swiss bacon. Yeah. Lettuce. Like I can't, I can't ingest all of that at all at once. So I need, I actually need some restraint. I need some parsing, some culling, some omission, a little bit left up to the reader. Yes. And that's well, challenging. And the other thing is too, that like, there are some people like a lot in hamburger and a complex hamburger, but even so not a donut in it, you know, yeah. like, and donuts are great that, you know, <laughs> And again, that is something else. And then there are some books that really need to be just a bun and a piece of meat. And I'm realizing I could probably take this metaphor like really I'm like, probably I'm, too far. I'm the worst with metaphors and aphorisms. So we could oh. go deep and we could go to a very dark place with <laughs> we, we, we or or a really exciting novel place that really maybe only one or two other people understand. That's true too. It can get yes. a little obscure. So yeah. I want to I want to come back and ask you a question because you've covered so many genres in your writing, and so mm -hmm. it's like you've got multi. You know, you're like a twelve speed bicycle. You're doing middle grade, not to be confused with middling. You're doing you know collaborating with James Patterson. You're writing young adult. How do you? Is that because you just have a lot to say and you want to, you know, pursue all of these options and like where does that come from with you? everything sounds fun to me and mm. that's the other thing is Tulani also and I'm sure you know this like the more ideas you have the more ideas you have so yeah. it's like the more you start doing things then you just start collecting all different kinds of ideas and so um you know I just, everything sounds fun and I am willing to give it a whack, really. Um, and I, that's the other thing is just the secret to writing is not being afraid to fail, you know, yeah. and to say like, okay, well, this is what I always tell writers, actually. You have to separate yourself from the work because not mm -hmm. everything you write is gonna be great. Not everything you write can be the best thing you ever write. By definition, there's only one thing that's going to be the best thing you ever write, and everything else is going to be not as good as that. Yes. So, you know, so um, what I always say is it's if something is not good, that does, or if people don't respond to it the way you want to, or, you know, you, it gets like it doesn't get the accolades you want, it, that is about just about the manuscript maybe needing more work. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a reflection on you as a, a writer, you know, like my kid's room is a mess, but uh, that doesn't mean that she's permanently messy. Right. You know, all it will take for her to be tidy is to work a little harder on cleaning up that mess, you know, yeah. and, uh, and that's, and so that's really the, again, the gift of, of, coming from editorial and that's really why I wanted to start Bookflow to show people that like there are always things you can do to be improving this work and that again that's the that's the curtain that reveals the truth that gets pulled back is that you see some of these brilliant writers hand in something that has to go through three four drafts something that is unpublishable, something that is like, yikes, you know, and you're like, but that person's a genius. And like, yeah, that's, that's what it is. They're a genius. And they mm -hmm. are putting down their ideas and they're engaging with it and they're developing it. And as the reader, we see the finished product, you right. know, and that's why you can never compare your in-process work to somebody else's finished book. You don't yeah. know, you don't know what it went through to get there. You know, you don't so, know what the editor had to say to whip oh. that into shape. I think we can totally like apply that to life. Yes. Like in general, right? <laughs> like we can just apply that in general. <laughs> like I always joke that like whenever someone gets upset about their social media, whenever they, because I, I have had my career in music and I'm like, you're listening, you're listening to the album that was released. My gosh, if you had any idea what it sounded like leading up to that you would it's a catastrophe it's supposed to be a catastrophe and like right. the whole process is you kind of throw this mess out hopefully mm -hmm. it's not 
a complete disaster, but you throw this mess out and then you just, you know, you shape it, you reform it, you get some critical distance from it. Cause I think that's the other part that a lot of, what I've heard a lot of the writers, particularly because we have so many of them in the Wolfer, a lot of them, um, you know, they're like, I had to leave that project alone for, you know, six months, a year. I couldn't, I had to get my head so completely out of that space so that when I came back to it, I could look at it discerningly and a little bit more objectively, you yeah. know, and then I could, you know, call the trash from it. Absolutely. Um, you have to let it go cold, you know, if you, if you can, um, mm -hmm. and do as much as you can to separate from it. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, that was, again, you know, part of, part of when I'm talking to business people about book flow, it's always a really interesting conversation. Um, because, uh, I'll say, you know, I developed this app book flow, uh, mm -hmm. for writers and they'll, and, and the business guys will be like, Oh, you need an app for that. Like, don't you just, if you have an idea for a book, don't you just sit down and write it? And it's like, no, um, because I, a, first of all, a book is not just one idea. You yeah. know, there's never one idea. It's not like, oh, I had that idea and then I wrote it. A book is a lot of ideas that yeah. are interacting and um, it might have one main message and it, you know, it has one main plot line, but even those, that plot line will intersect with, with many other plot lines. There'll be many other, you know, relationships, many relationships, and, and each one will have its own kind of idea, need its own genesis, and there's settings, and that requires, you know, a genesis, and, and so it's, it's a lot of ideas put together, and it's, so it's not like, yeah, I had an idea for page one and then I had an idea for page two. And oh my God. No. if only, I mean, but that's like, it's like anything else. It's like, I don't know, you felt like there should be justice. So, I mean, how hard can it be to be a lawyer? You know, right. <laughs> like you, you like to heal people. So, I mean, whatever, go operate. You know, it's like every, everything, there's always much more than what you can see at the finish line that has to go into it. And also I, I've tried to like, I try to communicate, someone will say, oh, you know, this, I'll use music as an analogy. Oh, my, my, my second cousin's nephew's next door neighbor is so talented. You should check out their blah, blah. And usually it's like some strange thing that comes over YouTube or it's self-recorded. And I'm like, that's, that's not exactly, it's like a journal entry. It's like a diary entry. It's like, yes, you have, you have made a sound and you've captured that sound and then you can disseminate that sound, but it does not make it a song. It doesn't have the structure. It doesn't have the, you know, it doesn't have the production. It doesn't have all of the infrastructure that's necessary to actually call it, you know, a piece of music. And, and writing is very much the same way. I think that what has been interesting in the past few years, especially with self-publishing and with the explosion of digital delivery is that it's in many ways, it's brought a lot of voices we would not normally have gotten to hear through traditional publishing to the fore. And so we have access to that, but it's also allowed for a lot of really uh, not ready work to come to the market. Um, I'm wondering if you have any opinions on that. I, I mean, my opinion is similar in that it's it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, right? Mm -hmm. Like. You know, and so it, I think I think it's great. You know, more people have access to um, releasing their work. But the thing is that there's always the people who are are really serious and passionate about getting better, and then there's the people who just want to be able to say that they did something and. Right. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's, it's fine to be able to say that you did something because honestly, Tulani, it's like, it's not even that easy to, to, to write something that isn't that good, you know, no, like, it's, right? it's, hard it's hard to be bad. It's hard it, to even be bad. <laughs> yes. Whatever bad that's, means. <laughs> right. Exactly. Like writing anything and especially like a long piece is a huge achievement. 
And there's a million reasons why people might want to do it. I mean, I, you know, I know people, someone who works, um, who has a publishing company that's specifically for helping people with their memoirs, modern memoirs. And uh, it's called, and um, she, my friend who works there, uh, Megan St. Marie, she is so passionate about helping people tell their own personal story because those personal stories are not necessarily going to reach a huge audience, but yeah. it's going to reach a super targeted audience that is really interested in reading it. And so that's kind of like, I think e-publishing can also do that. I mean, not everyone is necessarily, not everyone's reading to, for the same thing either, right? Yeah. Like some people love reading fan fiction because they're so passionate about those characters that they'll read a, a you know, just a, a bunch of different stories about those characters. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. So, yeah. Okay. So I, I kind of hesitate to be like, well, you know, I, I do, I do think it's really important to um, just kind of evaluate different, um, different pieces kind of for different reasons. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, I, I think, I actually think for the most part, um, self-publishing has really been just like a wonderful thing because it's it's allowed even more people to dream that dream yeah you know and to really engage with the work and now they know how hard it is yeah that's you true. know <laughs> there's nothing like trying something there's nothing like trying yeah <laughs> you know and and you'll learn so much just by i mean you know think about something like um like marathon running i mean that wasn't a thing that anyone did oh in the seventies. I can, I just, I, I mean, I don't do it. Oh my gosh. Like, I'm just so impressed, but I would Anyone die. who tries yeah. that, you know, and you don't have to be an elite athlete to benefit from that, or even from thinking about doing it or, and being like, well, I can't do that, but maybe I could do a 5k and yeah. my, you know, my parents can come and cheer for me or my child or my, you know, my, I would like to dogs. be able to consistently run around my block like not to be funny like I have so much respect because that is brutally hard I mean anything that's in and you know what everything's an endurance sport right everything's an endurance, endurance sport. sport marathon is endurance sport um I wanted Marriage to ask is an endurance sport oh my god friendship okay. is an endurance sport everything All of it. yeah it really I would say parenting I, I was trying to tell someone uh about getting lifetime achievement awards you know, and I was like, listen, the majority of the people who get lifetime achievement awards just doggedly show up every day. So it's just like writing. You have to sit down and just write, you know, right. as consistently as the, your universe allows you to. And at the end of it, it, you know, you'd be really challenged not to have turned something out, you know, of, of some consequence, even if it's only to you and, and your immediate family, which I think definitely has value on its own. Um, I wanted to ask you, so I was perusing some of the titles that mm -hmm. you've written. And one thing that I've noticed is like, you've got a lot of really great fantasy. Mm. And so some of your titles are just absolute, and some of the titles are wonderful. Like the Dreamway, I thought was a really cool concept. And Thank I love that you, yeah. And then the other one that I, cause I was running them by my kids, the tale, um, a tale of highly unusual magic. So you've got these really fun, fantastical stories and you you're basically it's like world building to another level and also for a specific demographic of reader that i'm fast i, I just I, I found the whole thing incredibly interesting please so the dream way is um i love that book and <laughs> like that was so much fun to create and so it's basically uh, set most of it is set uh, in a um, a dreamscape that is where dr where dreams run on rails like that's kind of set up like the New York City subway. So there's there's different lines for different things. There's uh, there's a line that's all different stops on memory dreams having to do with memories. 
some flying dreams, some, you know, uh, some embarrassing moments dreams, and then there's then there's a nightmare line. And um, the thing with the Dreamway was that it was meant to sort of be representative of the sub, you know, this subconscious world that we all sort of half inhabit. And and uh, one of the major characters in the real world is sort of is suffering from depression. And so the idea is that he's his sister feels he's trapped in this nightmare line. And the story is, it's both a fun fantasy romp about her her going to rescue him on on the uh, on the night from the nightmare line, but it's also kind of more deeply about like his his struggle. And the funny thing, the fun fact about the Dreamway is that it's the only book I've ever written that's been reviewed in the Lancet, which is like a British medical journal. Wow. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was fascinating to see that. You know, you, that's not the review that comes across your, but it was basically about how. You know, in it, uh, the book is attempting to tackle storytelling about depression on a metaphorical level. Um, so, uh, so that was that was a really interesting thing to work on. Um, I think, and I think I was just gonna say I think that that would be a really great one to give kids right now because yes. everybody being in like lockdown, and I think every I've I've kind of. I'm not joking, I'm not a clinical psychologist, so I don't know, but I feel like every single person I know is contending with a, a just the smallest or growing amounts of depression. Like, you know, right now is not necessarily the happiest time in human history. <laughs> I, I really don't understand how people could not be struggling right now. Um, yeah. You know, isolation, I'm, and again, I'm not a clinical psychologist either. You know, I'm just a writer, but I'm also someone who lives in the world. Yeah. And, uh, and isolation is really hard. And, um, you know, just the, the new normal is really hard. The other day, my, my daughter who just became a teenager, she was like, I want to do something and I want to do something that is not going for a walk. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, let's, let's Google fun things to do during COVID. Okay. Cause maybe there's something we haven't thought of. And I am not kidding too, Lonnie. Like, these articles were like, do a puzzle or clean your room. And it turns out that like the fun thing to do during COVID was to Google these articles and laugh and laugh about them because <laughs> those were not fun things. So yeah. I actually wrote the Dreamway at a time when I was feeling really it, like in a dark place and um, and I have, have struggled with anxiety and depression. And so, but you know, when I've told people that in the past, they've been like, oh, you should write a book about it. And I'm like, but that's not an interesting book. Like a book about someone who's depressed. It was hard for me to yeah, see how yeah. I was going to write a story that felt like it captured the experience in a way that was relatable. And it was kind of ironic that I went the other route and, and did something that was only relatable because it's metaphorical, right? It's not attempting to really, it's it's just re attempting to relay what the experience is like, not what the experience really is. Um, and in a way that freed me up to do it. But I think it's always kind of powerful to talk, or like sometimes talking around a thing yeah. is the best way to talk about a thing. Right. You know what I mean? So Absolutely. I think there's something like that. So I have that one, uh, it's supposed to be arriving in the next couple of days because I was like I'm gonna read this well okay. because I I've suffered with anxiety at various stages in my life and then I've had you know I don't have clinical depression but I've been depressed right from losing someone or different transitions and points in my life but also seeing you know having children because my kids are 12 and 14. Hmm. That's all I'm gonna say on that. <laughs> I love them to death, but there's a lot going on with the, you know the hormones and all of that and I was like oh you know this might be a way for us to have a conversation you know about their experiences so I I was that, when I saw that one I was like Ooh, we got to talk about but I love that lancet oh, oh yeah I know right that, that was, <laughs> right and then a tale of highly unusual magic is is about 
uh, half of it takes place in Texas, half of it takes place in Pakistan, in Lahore. And it's two girls. This part in Pakistan is actually an American girl who's visiting relatives, and the Texan is also a girl who's visiting relatives. And they both uh, encounter a, blank, a book that is blank, and when they write in it, the other one can see what's written, and, and the book writes back. It has its own story. And, and that book is really about like connections across time and place and how and how you know the most unexpected things can ultimately like bring people's lives have them intersect and overlap so there's like three different stories going on in there and that was kind of inspired by by two things first one being that I'm 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 from Texas and my husband is from Pakistan and um you know, just how in the world did these two people ever find each other, right? In a whole world full of billions of people. Um, and also it, it was inspired by this book that my grandmother gave me when I was 10, which actually her father had bought for her in France. It was a book of fairy tales, but the fairy tales were in English and my grandmother was German. So he wanted her to learn English. And so anyway, he brought that home to her and um, she eventually emigrated to the United States, you know, and gave it to me. But that also felt like such a magical journey for a, a book to go on to end up, you know, in my hands. So um, this was inspired by those two things. So I was another, you, you managed to pick two of my favorites. Oh, Good job. It. I could vibe it. I could feel it through the ether. <laughs> so I guess, I don't know. I mean, I kind of want to, because I know that I have to let you go soon, but I wanted to know like your, so you, you touched on a little bit with your daughter. How has, we're almost a year, almost a year in lockdown, essentially in COVID land. How yeah. are you faring? How's your family doing? How's your writing going? How's the business going? Well, it's 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 been quite the year. So actually, my um, my stepfather passed away at the end of January last year, and we're just coming up on his uh, the anniversary of his passing. And when he died, my mother came to live with us, which we thought was going to be temporary. Um, and then the lockdown happened and uh, she just ended up moving in with us, which has been great for us. Um, yeah. And so it has been a really rough year. And I will say at, you know, at the beginning I was full of all these great plans, right? Like I was gonna, I don't know. I don't even know what those plans were because I didn't <laughs> do them, right? So, <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, but I was really struggling and I was under deadline for, for my book, but I, I, I kept at it and I kept showing up even though it was bad. It, I honestly, and I, I handed it in and it was in rough shape and um, I knew it, but I, I couldn't see my way into it. But again, once it came back from my editor and I, and I looked at my, uh, at my piece in book flow and I was like, Oh, right. I can fix this. Um, I finally managed to, to sort of hit, hit a more normal stride after about six months and my creativity started coming back and, you know, it's been rough on our family. It's been really hard for my daughter. Um, it's been hard for my husband. It's been hard for my mom, but in the end, it's also an, you know, I hate to be Pollyanna-ish, but we feel really lucky to have each other. And I'm so happy that my mom was with us for this and that she wasn't, you know, living by herself or something. And, uh, and it's really, it's, we're both closer than ever and also driving each other more insane than ever. I mean, you know, but... <laughs> I don't know if you guys have got like we've gotten to the point where we just start laughing. We're like, right, you know, because you just turn, you're like, you're so totally on my nerve. <laughs> <laughs> right. And there is a closeness to that. I mean, there is a uh, you know, I always say, like, hey, 
you're not having a party until something gets broken. It's kind of, it's the difficult times that like knit us together, you know, that that nightmarish camping trip where the black flies descended, that, right, that horrible year where we were all in lockdown. And, you know, um, and so, yeah, you know, <laughs> I mean, I hate to be like, hashtag savor the memories. But, you know, ultimately, ultimately, we know each other in a way that we wouldn't have. And honestly, it's really interesting because my daughter is about the same age as your kids. And I know that this would normally have been a year that she would really have been pulling away from me. Yeah. But yeah. in a way, it's extended the kind of like closeness. And totally. yeah, I feel so. like it's like a, a gift from a strange place. <laughs> it is a gift from a straight from from a parallel universe. What was that? I don't know. There was an old Saturday Night Live sketch where they would be like, "Would you care for a glass of sand?" They would be like, <laughs> "Oh, you know, like it's a parallel universe where everything's crazy." That's totally. what it is. Completely, oh it's a God. glass of sand. <laughs> but we're drinking it. Cheers! Cheers! We're drinking it. <laughs> okay, yeah. so. <laughs> in closing, I'm saying it to you out loud because it's been an ongoing joke amongst our college. But I, my solemn oath is that if we ever get out of lockdown, I will attend a college reunion. And I yes. will be there too. <laughs> I will. I will. I, I was actually, I had to miss the last one because my niece decided to get married. But I had been like on the planning committee for you know, over a year. And then all of a sudden my niece was like, I'm getting married that very same weekend in oh. Wisconsin. So <laughs> I feel like I if, we, <laughs> if we ever get out of here, I will see you there. I actually mm -hmm. went to, I went to one. I actually went, maybe I went to two. I don't even remember. Um, and it was surprisingly fun. And That's you know, keep telling me. I know it doesn't seem any. likely, but but it really is. Okay. And well, I, we're yeah. like old enough now that I like don't remember anything yeah. very well. But so I mean, as a result, I only have very good memories of every single person. We're all and I'm just gonna be honest with you, like we're also old enough now that if we don't like it, we can get in our car and leave. And yeah, I mean, nobody can stop us. We're not gonna fail a class, like you know, they won't even notice we're gone. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I just wanted to make sure that I went on the record. And so at, at okay. the minimum, we will, the two of us will be there. We will be there. You know, you gotta, you gotta have at least one person. <laughs> oh, exactly. We'll be in the corner with the, you know, with a little wine and we'll be yeah. making comments and exactly. it'll be fun. It'll be just like back, back when we were in school. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Reliving oh those <laughs> All right. Well, I don't know. Is there anything else that, is there anything I didn't cover that you feel like the world needs to know? Because I want to make sure we get it all out. Well, you know, the one, I want to say one other thing about Bookflow and book at bookflow.pub. Thank you. Um, that, which, which is that there's always like a new writing prompt on there every single day, you know, because it's hard to stay inspired. And I think that's another thing that like people need to remember that you're not always coming at this with like a fresh idea. And it's also good to warm up, to warm up your creativity. Yeah. I don't know if you, do you journal? I don't journal. I used to journal. I actually, I'm one of those people who was annoying and was like, I'm going to write a book in lockdown. And so I wrote a manuscript that's, in lockdown. So yeah, I, I know that it. about you. That's not uh, annoying. I think that's really cool. Well, it's either, I feel like everything was, every, either they were like working out to lose weight, didn't do that, gained a whole lot. Or they oh, were like, yeah. I'm gonna, I don't care. I ate everything and I plan to keep eating everything forever. Like, so that's just, I put that out the window. But um, no, I don't journal. I try, I did journal when I was a teenager and I, my sister read it and like, I was annoyed with her. And then she took like something and turned it into lyrics for herself. So I did get into ASCAP because of my meddling sister. That's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> but no, why do, why do you ask about the journaling? I ask about that because I'm terrible at journaling and I, I don't journal um, mostly because I can never think of anything to say. 
Um, but I do believe in like doing a writing warm up. So the only reason I bring it up is because, you know, that's part of why I provide like a creative warm up every day on, on Bookflow. One day, my uncle, who is also a writer, said to me, you know, what he'd been doing was just looking at um, art before writing and then writing quickly for like 10 minutes to um, inspire ideas. Um, and that he really felt like it was connecting his synapses in really interesting ways and doing interesting things for his brain. Oh, so nice. I just kind of started toying with the idea of a creative journal. So it's not a journal, it's just a fresh micro creativity like prompt um, daily. And so, so there's a, a fresh thing every day to interact with on, on Bookflow. And I really think that just getting those juices warmed up, you know, you cannot have original output if you have no new input. Yeah. So, so I always tell people, if you want to write something interesting, go try to live an interesting life. Absolutely. Or at, at, if you can't do that, because ain't none of us doing that right now, you, you, can, interesting life. Yeah, you can read something interesting or look at something interesting or, you know, something, something. Yeah. It's too much pressure to try and extract something from yourself all the time. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Ooh, I feel like we're going to have to hold a whole other interview because I didn't get to talk to you about developing an app and getting into the tech sphere and what that's all about. Cause I'm sure that's a whole other amazing it, conversation. And journey. It, that has also been a journey and fascinatingly, like I always say everything I'm learning, you know, about being an entrepreneur, I kind of already knew from being a novelist, which mm. is you've got to iterate, you got to try a lot of different ideas, but yeah, that can be a whole, a whole other chat because, um, I mean, I don't know if all of your chats are like this, but like, this has been super fun for me, you know? So Just me. I'm the only one who's just, no, I'm kidding. They're all wonderful. <laughs> Everyone's wonderful. <laughs> I am sure. I'm sure. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, but not every, not everyone wants to hang out with your dogs as much as I do. Right. You're always welcome. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I want to just, uh, everyone, it's bookflow.pub. And then Lisa's, uh, your website is lisapapa.com. Yes, .com. yes. And you can also find her at all your major booksellers online and brick and mortar. Anything, any other social? No, no. Okay. come check out bookflow.pub if you're a writer. Um, and there's a 28 day free trial and you can keep access to all your work, even if you don't ever pay, you can always download it. Um, and I'll, I'll be hanging out with you on Friday. Yes, you will. I'm very excited. The writers are like beside themselves. So thank oh, you. Oh, good. Oh, I'm beside myself. <laughs> All right. Well, that will conclude our interview for today. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It was awesome to hang out with you. Anytime. <laughs>